This could be anywhere in Slavic Europe, except it's not. It's New Zealand. These old friends and acquaintances are gathered to celebrate something pretty special. The 60th anniversary of their arrival in New Zealand as Polish orphans at the end of World War II. Their story began in September 1939, when Soviet troops invaded eastern Poland, while the Poles were already locked in a desperate struggle with the German army in the west. In August 1939, Communist Russia allied itself with fascist Germany by signing the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact of Non-Aggression. At the same time, they signed a secret protocol to partition Poland between them. On September the 1st, Hitler's armies invaded Poland from the north and west. 17 days later, the Soviets delivered a deadly blow by attacking Poland from the east. Eastern Poland, where the children came from, fell under Russian control. Without delay, the Soviets began arresting military leaders and followed this with massive deportations of civilians. Among these people are some of the 733 Polish orphans who arrived here in 1944, who lived to tell an important tale, one of loss, survival, hope, adversity and triumph. The life of each one of them is a story within a story, with a backdrop provided by the horrific events of World War II. I was deported uh, in 1940. My mother uh, was away visiting her older sister, who was in Warsaw. And I was staying with my grandparents my mother's, on my mother's side. And uh, her maiden name was Popwanowski also. So uh, I was on the deportation list and so was my mother because my father was a uh, banker in, in, the, in the, an officer in the reserves, so he was on the list twice. Some people were displaced through the war starting and they happened to be on the eastern side so they got deported. Uh, my friend uh, Popowski, he was one of those. He was from Warsaw but he just happened to be in the wrong place. And in fact I would never have been deported if I was where I should have been in Katowice. It was middle of the night when we got told by the Russian soldiers to pack your gear and get going because you're leaving. Where we were leaving, we didn't know. And no uh, amount of remonstrating uh, would make them realise that only this 20-month-old baby, which was me, was actually on the list. My grandparents and my aunt and the two boys uh, weren't supposed to go. Um, but uh, that made no difference. They just made us all sh uh, pack up and go. Uh, my grandmother died of a heart attack, and uh, the rest of us um, were taken away, and my mother was left behind. So I got separated in that sort of way. I was only nine years old when I left Poland, and there was uh, my mother, father, three sisters, uh, two sisters, and mum was pregnant. So there will be three sisters we discover afterwards. But the wee one, she only lasts nine months in Russia. I can still see these women yelling out to us, uh, you're going to be very happy and you're going to be this because we've got factories that manufacture oranges. Unbelievable. <laughs> Manufacturing oranges. But there we are. That wasn't true. The massive population transfers, forced deportations, forced migrations occurring in Poland at this stage, um, in many ways mark out, symbolise Poland's experience of the Second World War. And I think, if we're going to speak in general terms, arguably they suffered perhaps more than any other country in a global sense in the Second World War. Um, on the first hand, you have population transfers and deportation occurring in the German-occupied sector of Poland. The same sorts of things happen in the Russian-occupied sector. On the German side, they go in there with a, particularly with a racial um, policy which determines how they act, the policies they actually implement. On the Russian side, it's more a class-based ideology which affects the way that they treat the population of Poland. 
Russians made a point of targeting particularly threatening groups of people. Those people in leadership roles, those people with military experience, those people who have been part of Poland as a nation. Some of the orphans were the sons and daughters of these officers and soldiers. Four vast railway convoys carried them to remote areas of Siberia, Kazakhstan and the Far East. In February, April and June 1940 and June 1941. We were taken in cattle trucks, in wagons, and I think I had a four as a little baby because I still have a little scar here. Um, that's about it, I think. Uh, I remember being in Siberia, being very hungry, being very cold, standing in just one little nighty that I was wearing from Poland, standing in a queue waiting for bread, each day. In 1941, while these children and their parents were incarcerated in Siberian work camps, their story was to take another turn when Germany broke its non-aggression pact with Russia. This blow to Russia turned out to be a saving grace for the Poles. And the whole picture dramatically changed. Russia was now aligned with the Western powers. An agreement was signed between Stalin and General Sikorsky, Prime Minister of the Polish government in exile, and the Poles suddenly found they were free the Soviets, who for two years acted as Hitler's chief accomplices, now turned to the Poles for assistance. This meant that some Polish people were given permits to leave the camps. A mass exodus took place from Siberia and Kazakhstan south to Uzbekistan, where the Polish army was forming. I was taken away to a Russian uh, orphanage. I was there for about six months, I suppose and uh, there was a notification to say uh, any children that were in Russian uh, orphanages to get them together and eventually I managed to get there and that's the last time I saw my mother. Later on uh, I think my father was shot into the mass graves in Siberia and when the Polish general made an agreement with Stalin, I recall my mother carrying me diagonally across the field of snow to the meeting place from which we were to leave um, Siberia. Then I briefly remember our trip on open trucks, um, looking up at the sky and seeing all the stars. As a little child, I was lying just on my little bundle of all the worldly belongings that I had. But it was too late for some. This was a time of great confusion. Some families were separated with parents too ill to take care of their young ones, let alone travel with them to yet another camp. Many did not survive the journey, leaving their children to join the ever-growing ranks of Polish orphans. For many, it was a case of luck. Could they actually get permission from the Soviets to travel? Two, could they actually pay for the rail travel itself? Many Poles, unfortunately, were not in a position to even make this trip, and they remained stranded where they were. Others made the trip, but again, in very horrific um, circumstances, the sort of conditions which mirrored the conditions that they had been deported from Poland in the first place. Long trips, harsh conditions... Rampant disease, overcrowding, unhygienic. Many thousands came to the end of their journey in Russian graves. Later, small Russian boats ferried the surviving children across the Caspian Sea to Persia. By 1942, middle of 1942, actual relations between the Polish government in exile, the Polish army as has been reconstituted, and the Soviet Union continued to actually deteriorate. And so ultimately... Um, and here we get back to the Russians, how their war situation had changed, how they perceived this Polish army. In many ways, the last thing they wanted on their back doorstep was a large and growing Polish national army. They would rather have, as they later did, construct a Polish army which would be part of the Red Army, in many ways fully, firmly under Soviet control. Therefore, the Polish army was forced to leave Soviet territory and relocate to Persia. So, in 1942, some 116,000 soldiers their families and some orphan children 
were evacuated from Uzbekistan to Persia, now known as Iran. We went to Iran. Arriving there, I, the most devastated, I c c caught a terrible disease, malaria. Ah, oh, dear me, that's devastating. But anyhow, they used to give us hanin, which is very powerful stuff, and if you <laughs> if you survive that, you survive anything. Climbing up this uh, stairway to get to the boat, and the, f the further I climbed, the, the heavier the blanket got, and I just collapsed. And uh, anyhow, anybody was in that situation, they, well, they just swung you over the board and into the sea. And I, <laughs> they're picking me up, and I just happened to I opened my eyes, and they says, oh, this guy is still alive. So in Persia, we later went to Tehran, and we were treated royally there by the Shah of Persia. I understand we lived in some of his harems, I guess they were called, and they were beautifully ornate places. I can still see there's a lot of young people, 14, 15, 16 years of age, they were staying actually in the same outfit. And they were so proud that they had their military hats and shoes and boots and you name it. And they were ready to go to Mount Cassino. And they were only just young people. It was so sad to see it. After two years in Persia, the Polish troops, now incorporated into the British Army, were moved to fight in the Middle East, North Africa and Italy. They fought alongside the New Zealand Army at Monte Cassino. Their departure removed the military protection of the orphan children and their dispossessed caregivers, who were again given their marching orders to ship out to yet another and even stranger place. On the arrival in Persia, my grandfather died of TB. Um, I remember sitting on the casket on the back of a truck going to the cemetery of him. And we stayed two years in Persia um, with these other children who were different camps that we went from one camp to another, Nisfahan and Tehran. And we were there for two years before uh, um, coming to New Zealand. Thousands of Polish children were orphaned when their parents either died or were shot in Siberia or joined the Polish army in Persia. Of these children, 733 had gone through many perils, but they would go through one more, a journey thousands of kilometres across the ocean on a ship floating upon hope until they reached here, New Zealand, Aotearoa, their new home, which for most was to give them refuge for a lifetime. to New Zealand we came out on the General Randall. It was fairly crowded and I think a lot of us possibly had our hair shaven off because we had lice uh, from overcrowded conditions. Um, uh, but I remember the American soldiers were very good to us. I remember falling out with one of my friends and sitting in the corner sulking and this porthole or something opened up and out came this American sailor with thick bar of chocolate. <laughs> we came across the U-boat when we were coming to New Zealand. Hmm. Yeah, so um, I was fascinated by the trail it made, and um, I was standing on the deck there. So I heard a couple of boys call out, you know, they, you know, for them it's all adventure. They all say, "Here's one coming, there's one coming," and they were pointing there, and of course that was the torpedo coming at our ship. So I went over there to where they were trying to see it, but I couldn't. So Then after that, they chased us inside. So the discussion for the rest of the day was what would happen if it hit the ship. We thought of all sorts of things, except for the fact that we could have been at the bottom of the sea. We used to travel around the world like a parcel, and you just arrived in New Zealand, and that was just another place. For the Poles, there are no relatives or acquaintances. 
but there are many friendly faces. New Zealanders who've heard so much of the southern 25 children and 113 adults to two trains for the last stage of their journey. At that time in 1940, in 40s, the New Zealand had only three colours. There was the green on the roof and red, and the creamy walls. And we were just amazed, and the lights shining everywhere, and it just seemed so beautiful. The welcome we got when we arrived in New Zealand was absolutely unreal. Palmerston North seems to regard the event as a good reason for a long lunch hour, and packing the station and standing by the railway line through the square to make a welcome for our guests. Many bring flowers and sweets and ice cream. I mean, those people obviously uh, were very genuinely welcoming us when we arrived, and, and there's no doubt about it. That, we, we do owe them a great thanks for that. They, they really did make us feel very welcome. The long journey comes to an end. Krakow and Warsaw and Lublin seem a long way from Pajatur. Only a few miles now of all the thousands they've travelled to find a home. Of a hound. Particularly with the Maori Welcome Committee. They were from a Maori haka. And I felt like running back and going back to Persia. <laughs> it was very joyful the first day when we arrived. I think I remember jumping out from the truck. And the soldier picked me down. And I think it, first as, after we went inside the barracks, you know, to have a look where our beds were, or we r rolled out on the grass. We went out outside and we rolled in the grass. There is much to be seen. New ways of doing things have to be investigated. Extremely warm welcome that we received from the local community. And then we sort of fit in into a normal daily routine at Paiatua again. The meal, their first New Zealand binder, was stowed away despite the sweets and ice creams they'd had on the train. Army camps to half begin to wonder what the army is coming to. And a wonderful feeling was going to the bed, nice clean sheets, a nice pillow to lie on it. That was a really great feeling. They can dream in peace, for this is a home. This is the end of their journey. After being on a boat for, for nearly two months or something like that, actually, you, when you come to New Zealand and it's coming from... Uh, hot country like Iran, we used to call it Persia. It was, it was so different, actually. It was actually different. And the people were being so, so nice to us. Everybody welcomed us, and we just thought it was just coming like to, to second heaven. <laughs> Many of the orphans, like Stefa and Josef Zavada, married their sweetheart from the camp. You develop such an identity. Uh, you know exactly who you are. You belong to that group, and uh, that particular, well, it's your mother, father, brother, sister. Is that right, Joe, would yes. you say? Yes. As um, Stefan said, uh, strength came from our group. Like if you were in a group in a class, you had a few friends there, and the whole barrack became your sort of extended family in effect. And um, our class, it was say 27 or 28 in the classroom, so they were your brothers and sisters, mm. basically, and that was it, that was the family. As a result of an agreement between the New Zealand and Polish governments, Pahiatua Camp became their first home in New Zealand. The former race course was transformed from a Japanese POW camp to a place that became Little Poland, where 733 children would be housed and educated for the next five years. All their education continued to be in Polish, with some English lessons, based on the assumption that they would return to Poland after the war. They look forward to dancing someday soon in their own land again. Meanwhile, they're faring well. The boys were on one side of the camp, and we were on the other side of the camp. I didn't even see that much of my brothers because of that sort of thing, you know. But, um, but we were allowed, as I... Um, to work in the kitchens, of course, when it was our turn, and and late after the first year, when we got a, got to liking some of the boys, when we worked in the kitchen there, we made sure that they got an extra apple underneath the cap, 
<laughs> I suppose they wondered sometimes why the apple was there. But <laughs> well, my life at the camp was the most wonderful time that I can remember now. We were so happy there. We were, well, we were poor. I remember having just shoes, no socks. But we were there as a family. And although I left for high school to go to Timaru, not to return again to the camp, or to live with my friends and the people I had come out with, I've always looked upon them as my family. And although I say I'm alone without a family, I have a family of 733. Our female teachers, and there were majority female teachers, Polish and some New Zealand teachers, were like mothers to us. And uh, some of the returned soldiers, Polish returned soldiers, actually worked in the camp uh, together with the New Zealand army. They were sort of our dads. To enable these children to experience ordinary family life, Teresa Wall, Nee Kelly, remembers her family opening their home to the orphans. Well, we're Catholics, and I rather think that perhaps the people of the parish were asked, could they take somebody, these Polish children coming to New Zealand? And I rather think that my mother, who was a great, wonderful woman, said, yes, me, we'll do it, we would love to have them. So that's how they came to us in about, in 60 years ago. Back in 1945, I think it was, the first Christmas that we spent in Paiatua, uh, by prior arrangement, um, majority of, uh, of us children, the younger ones, were sort of allotted out to uh, Kiwi families, uh, you know, all over uh, New Zealand. And uh, I was one of the fortunate ones to uh, go to Kelly's, uh, Teresa Kelly's uh, uh, house that's in uh, Tiroti in Haura, the, on a farm there. He was a lovely kid, and lovely kids are very easy to, to blend into a family. And farming people are, are really, they're quiet, easygoing people. And Zygmunt just blended in, he was just like a little brother. Uh, the other thing I like, um, I recall is uh, having porridge with uh, uh, cream, you know, because in prior to a camp, you know, we, we had no luxuries like that, you know. And one day uh, somebody asked me, well, uh, where did the cream come from? And I said, well, the bull comes from the uh, cows and the, the cream comes from the bull, you know. <laughs> and that, you know, that stuck with me <laughs> until this present day, you know. And we'd get put on the train with this tag round our neck. And the Campbells, bless her soul, Tess, before she died, she said, I've got something for you. And she gave me this tag. And on it's got Wanganui, Mrs. T. Campbell, number three line. And on the reverse is, on Her Majesty's service, Kajimia Zayans, on Tuesday, 5.20. So this would be round your neck like this. And you'd get put on a train. And as the train went along the length of the island, <coughs> the conductor would come around and have a look at your ticket, and he'd say, oh, Wanganui. So he'd turf you off at Wanganui. And you all got out on the platform, and you'd stand in a row, and people would come and have a look at their tag to see which one was for them. Like many of the orphans, Kajik became very close to his foster family. They were mum and dad. In, in, in all respects, you know, they uh, made sure you were on the rails, made sure you did this and that. I just wish they were still alive. I owe them so much. All that remains of the thriving Pahiatua camp are memories, a museum and a monument to testify that it ever existed, providing pilgrimage points for those who want to come back and remember. Where their school, church, dormitories and classrooms used to be is an empty paddock and an empty place in their hearts. A feeling of um, sadness 
that uh, that sort of the, the, the memory of that past life was disappearing. S- sort of feel a sense of loss that that's disappeared. Part of my history is gone, I feel. Um, yes, I'd like to have sort of gone back and reminisced and seen, oh, this is where this was, this is where we had our church services. And when it finally came to leaving the camp... That was uh, devastating. <laughs> it's... Uh, as I said, you, you make your friends and you... and you, I, I didn't find out till last minute where, I'm, where, I, where I was going. I think the thing we hated the most is when it disbanded and they sent us all to different schools and different families and that. Because, after all, I've been with some of them for about four or five years, actually. A few of them, I think, up to about five or six years. Again on the army trucks to be driven to pay a tour, and we're heading from Wellington. From Wellington, uh, overnight we travel by uh, by boat to Christchurch, and uh, honestly thought I was back in Iran. The, the hills, Littleton Hills, were just burnt, and that was second of February, 1949, when I arrived in Christchurch. Uh, we were met at the railway station. And here's me, us, again on my own. For most, being sent away from, and the eventual disbanding of, the Pahiatua camp was a devastating experience, which renewed those feelings of being an orphan. Their customs and language poles apart from a still alien New Zealand culture, poles apart from their lost homeland and the camp they called home. Their future is uncertain. This uncertainty in a post-war environment made them feel very confused because there's a lot of talk at the Paratua camp and probably in New Zealand that we have to go back to Poland because the Polish government, the communist Polish government in, in, in Poland laid a complaint to the United Nations that they want the, the orphans back. So in 1945 when the Alta Conference gave one third of our land to Russia and put the, the other part under the influence of Russia, the wise New Zealand government and wise heads at the Catholic Church decided, no, those kids must not go back to Russia. The uh, Polish government in Warsaw tried to get us back and they sent out representatives, but the government says no. Some of the children did go back because they got letters from their mothers and you know if they asked them to come back you don't refuse do you but um, we still were curious to see what it was like so we were asked one of the girls to write us to let us know the letters were sa- still censored at the time so we asked her to write it in ink if it's okay and in pencil if it's not so of course the letter came back in pencil so we knew that the conditions were not very good in Poland. We were free to decide for ourselves. <clears throat> and like for me, there wasn't much use me going because I had no parents there or any of the uh, sisters. Uh, so we both, three of us decided we're going to stay in New Zealand. The orphans received a letter from the Prime Minister's office. It has been suggested that those who have attained the age of 18 and over should be given the opportunity of deciding whether they would like to return or to remain in New Zealand. And the agreement was made with the Polish government in London. I understand that we were free to stay in New Zealand. It is the government's wish that those young people should have complete freedom of choice and that their decisions should not be influenced by any consideration other than their future happiness. I, I, was, oh, I was guilty all the time to think, oh gosh, I stayed in a good country and all that, and my brothers went back, and mum had a very difficult time because it was just, you know, just over the wall, and she was in a strange place too. What we have here is, from 1943-44 onwards, is increasing domination of Poland as a nation by the Soviet Union and effectively under military control. The Red Army, the NKVD, what we have here is a, despite um, promises to introduce free elections and a democratically elected government, we have a regime which is 
supported by, propped up by, controlled and conditioned by the Soviet Union itself. And so what happens in Poland in 1945 onwards, for two years you basically have a civil war where the remaining elements of the Polish army, Polish nationalists, fight ultimately what is a losing battle against Soviet forces. What we have here is a restructuring of Polish society. The government, as I say, is dominated by, effectively becomes a communist bloc regime. Many Poles are either trapped in the situation or those who are lucky enough to still be outside Eastern Europe at the war's end cannot and although they are reluctant, will not return to Poland because the life there is one fraught with insecurity and instability. But a new country at least gave the orphans hope for a better life. Spisik Poplowski is a final year medical student at the public hospital. He did all kinds of jobs to help put himself through medicine. Some of the orphans were lucky enough to have the support of family they had come with to New Zealand. Zbyszek Popowski, now retired, who became a doctor and an orthopaedic surgeon, was one. My aunt, like most Europeans, from the word go, uh, um, encouraged uh, her son and myself to go to, to go to university, ultimately. Uh, when I was very young, she used to say to me, you're going to be a doctor. When I asked her why, it, uh, she said, oh, it's because I always used to walk around with my hands behind my back when I was a kid. And apparently that's what doctors do in war rounds in Poland, so I was going to be a doctor. And I said, oh, no, I'm not. I was going to be an engineer. So I went to university in Victoria, uh, and halfway through the year I decided she was right. So I switched over to the uh, medical course uh, at the end of that year. Uh, went to Dunedin. Uh, did a degree in physiology uh, to get university to get to the medical school entrance, and then just progressed on from there. I went to school in Timaru. I had chosen to go there because my friend was going there. But when I heard how strict the nuns were, I remember throwing my one and only tantrum and refusing to go there. But the powers that be said, "You've made your decision. You're going." So I did my utmost to put my age up. I was going to leave the place, run away. <laughs> and in the end, I stayed five years, set school certificates, learned English, French and Latin, the same as everybody else, and managed to pass. And became a nun herself, getting involved with the Māori community when she was posted to Greymouth. But deep down, I knew I wanted to make a sacrifice of my life and the choice to become a nun was because I wanted to return something for my life spared and I wanted to do something in this in New Zealand and in the community in which I worked. She remained a teaching sister for 20 years. Also decided to teach myself the guitar in Greymouth and of course I'd bike down to my guitar lessons every Saturday morning and I think I was called the flying nun in those days. <laughs> so I always fancied Julie Andrews and I thought, well, she can sing, so can I. And then I was chosen to come and work full time from the Catholic Mary Mission team and I just loved that work and I had started to do the... Um, uh, certificate in social work so there was one time there was this challenge for me for higher education and I wished to continue that and unfortunately I sort of saw that as no alternative but for me to leave. More than 30 years later Julie is still sharing her love of singing and playing her guitar. There were so many of us went to different towns or cities and uh, I was one that went to Greymouth. My sisters went to um, Second Heart here in Christchurch. Then when I uh, finished in Greymouth, I learned a little bit English there. Not only the good words but the bad ones too, like all the young ones do. <laughs> um, uh, I come to Christchurch. And I've been here ever since. Where Tadak went to work for Firestone Tyres and was later sent to Kenya as a training supervisor, helping to set up a new plant. 
These days he is happily retired and makes playhouses for his grandchildren as a hobby. Once I got to go see, actually, that was quite a normal thing in those days. Actually, when you got to go to certificate, you started looking for some, or some job. I wasn't keen on getting sort of an uh, ordinary, well, uh, <laughs> manual job. I thought of getting a job in a bank would be quite nice. And I had an interview at the Bank of New South Wales in Omaru, and originally I was thinking of joining Bank of New South Wales. But I knew a family who had friends in Wellington who were at... The, who, who, who were working at Bank of New Zealand, who, one of the accountants at Bank of New Zealand Wellington. And I there really didn't want to settle in Omaru. I wanted to go back to Wellington, where most of the... There was a Polish hostel for, mayor, for boys and girls, and there was quite a large Polish community. So it would have been good to return back to, to Wellington. And uh, I had an interview with the Bank of New Zealand management. They accepted me, and I started working as a junior clerk in BNZ. And he went on to become data bank manager, pioneering computerization of banking in New Zealand. After leaving Pahiatua camp, Boleswath's career got off to a fairly rocky start. I'll finish service stream, and I just left to my own devices. I was not quite so 17 years of age then. I had no money, no place to go, no work. So a friend of mine from Silverstone College, he said, well, come and stay with us for a few days. So I stayed in the garage, slept there for three months before I found it, <laughs> before I found accommodation. And then I had a letter from education department to come and join them to work for them. <clears throat> so I joined the education department for about two or three years and did a part-time varsity at the Victoria University. And during that period, Chief Welfare Officer came in to give us a talk at the university. I belonged to the uh, club association, the other association, Adolescents and Childhood Group. And after the talk, we had a cup of coffee, and he came to me and gave me a card. He said, if you want a job, come and see me. So I never thought of that anything. But ten, ten weeks later... He rang me, he says, oh, what about having afternoon tea with me? So I went there and was appointed as a residential social worker at Campbell Park School in Omaru. With the need to help people acting as a driving force, Boleswaf went on to become a regional manager and principal for residential services for the Department of Social Welfare. I knew I wanted to fly from a very, very early age. I was just a thought. It was the support and encouragement from the Campbells, his foster family, that enabled Kajik to fulfil his dreams. And I remember at Campbell's when I was just a little wee kid, she, Mrs Campbell asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I wanted to be a pilot. And she said, why do you want to be a pilot? And I said, I want to drop bread on Poland. And she, before she died, she said they were very prophetic words because when you went top dressing, it's a very similar thing. <laughs> and Kajik went on to become a very successful airline pilot. John Roy is now financial director for New Zealand for a worldwide company. And there is an amazing symmetry to the chosen career of former Mainzeal Construction CEO, John Roy Wojciechowski. In 1941, it was the then Polish consul in New Zealand, Count Wojcicki, who was instrumental in getting the Polish children here in the first place. And now, 60 years later, John Roy is himself the honorary Polish consul. I've, I've had a successful business career, but to me, being appointed an honorary consul uh, for the Republic of Poland was the ultimate accolade. I've had a fortunate life, a very fortunate life. You know, I know I suffered, and my family suffered at the beginning, but when, when one looks at the whole picture... I, I had a very fortunate life. It was hard work. It, that, it doesn't come easy, you know. Even speaking today and tomorrow, as I will be, you know, I have to make an effort to write a, 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 a comprehensive speech so it means something. To the children and grandchildren of Paiatua children, we have left you a legacy of high moral standards and high dedication to the community but it told the people exactly what the Paiatua family 
was all about. So that requires an effort, knowledge, and disciplines, that, and, and these sort of things that I learned as a businessman. So, fortunate life, yes, I have. Yeah. New Zealand has also treated Tony well. His love of music may have led to a musical career, had he been in a position to pursue it further. There was a chance, uh, but with changing high schools, changing uh, music teachers, I had free and all, and of course, when you shift around, you get a bit devastated, and uh, I, I finished up, I, I did go when I left school, and the music teacher that I had just, <laughs> she wasn't capable of pushing me the way my first music teacher used to push me, which was lesson every day. And that's what you need to become any quality play or any concert play. And uh, that really frightened me. With the fear that his living circumstances were likely to be changed beyond his control yet again, his need to put down roots led him to make an important, life-changing decision. I decided, what's enough, it's enough. I've had enough of this being shifted around and pushed around, and I thought, I'll start start work, which I took on hairdressing. After doing a four-and-a-half-year apprenticeship, Tony was in a position to buy his own business, which was... Ready to open on Monday morning, which was 18th of March, 1957. Like 48 years, it doesn't <laughs> seem like 48 years. It seems like out of day, but the time goes quick, doesn't wait for anybody. I've enjoyed the work I was doing, doing... I made a lot of friends. Uh, I've got three generations of customers coming to my shop. And uh, eventually, <laughs> eventually I intend to stop, but when, I don't know. Henya, always a good performer, left school, married and continued her singing and dancing interests with her husband in various musical theatre productions. We joined uh, a little group of singers and, and performers, <laughs> and we had a concert, you know, every three months or so. We used to and sing-alongs, nights, and a lot of fun. I think it kept us going. I think my songs really kept me going because we loved that sort of thing in the old days. And it was uh, Chisha's love of craft that has helped her through many a tough yes, time in the past. Bits of paper. We used to get the boys to make the knitting needles out of um, packing wire. And we used to learn knitting there and some of the girls learned crochet in that. And, of course, once I learned how to make the socks, you see, I, um, I decided to carry on with it. And, of course, we were always short of wool in that. There was no way of getting wool except, uh, you know, from some other means. So we used to go to the storeroom and ask for beanie hats because knew, we knew they had them. And um, they probably knew what we were up to because... We never wore them, so we used to unpick them and use it for knitting. So I decided to carry on with those socks, and I made myself a pair of stockings, you know. But, of course, each time we went for beanie hat, there would have been different colours, and that's, you can just imagine what sort of stockings there were. So <laughs> I think I did put them on once, but it's all, after that I probably got unpicked and used for something else. Yusuf is a retired accountant. His wife, Stefa, started out as a teacher, but ended up working for the Department of Internal Affairs. Both are very active members of the Polish Society in Wellington. And Zygmunt was a quality controller. The last 15 years of his career spent working at the Pilkington Glass Factory. A little bit of Poland, or at least what Poland used to be, is well established in New Zealand. Little did they know, but when they came here in 1944, the orphans started an immigration wave to New Zealand from war-torn Europe. These little people have been wandering for nearly five years. They're broken pieces of once peaceful communities. They're remnants of families. These are the people who wore up roots and cast aside. But with that sympathy came some prejudice. I had to be slightly better than the average New Zealander. If I pray for a job, I did quite a bit of research, and I had a five promotion in ten years. 
And I had to prove myself, literally sell myself, that I'm better than the other applicants. And that's got me through reasonably well. I remember one particular instance, this gentleman, he said, well, these bloody foreigners are here, they're here five minutes, and uh, they got everything. And I, I was really, I've had guts full of it by then, listening to all this. And I said to this guy, now, how would you like your hair cut? He says, what do you mean? I said, I'm one of these bloody foreigners you're talking about. <laughs> well, he shrunk in the chair. Oh, he says, Tony, I thought you were a Kiwi. I says, yes, I'm Kiwi, but polished by birth. <laughs> and I've been called bloody foreigner many times. But I took that in my chin, and uh, I might be bloody foreigner, but I'm doing well here. No, never, except in jest. I remember one of the senior pilots in the NAC when I was flying for NAC. I was just a co-pilot then. He used to call me a Russian spy. <laughs> Even after 60 years in New Zealand, the orphans maintain strong cultural ties to Poland. Some aspects have been easy to maintain, like food. They're making pierogi. You won't get much more Polish than that. But some things the orphans struggled with. For instance, learning English. And that became very evident when they left the safe confines of Pahia to a camp and were sent out into the wide world. And suddenly that put out into English-speaking schools, um, and that was a bit difficult for a while, because the English sort of learnt uh, an hour three times a week in, in, in the camp. Uh, it wasn't really adequate to, to uh, uh, go on with, to begin with. In fact, uh, the kids in the class thought I must have just recently arrived because I spoke so little English, but that you soon picked it up, you had to. Fortunately, at the very beginning, I had a, there was a private firm, a wholesale firm that I worked for, and um, the the people were beautiful. You know, really, they they helped me a lot, and there was, in fact, they went out of the way to make sure that I knew, and some words that I didn't know, they always explained to me what they were and all that. My lang my. Um, English wasn't as good as, as it is now. It's not very good now, I know, but <laughs> it was much worse then. I lost complete contact with the, contact with the Polish community for about 20 to 25 years, because I was shifted from Kimball Park School to Hamilton, to the Needham, to Lower Hutt, to Head Office, so I sort of couldn't keep in touch with them, because quite often there was no pause in that area. So I became probably more fluent in English than I was in Polish. I had virtually no contact at all till we went to uh, Poland in '94 because we wanted to trace back some family. And uh, for a week or two before we went, I used to think on the way to the letterbox, what's this in Polish? What's that in Polish? And, and I sort of got a little bit of momentum up, and by the time I went to Poland, I spoke just like a native. They speak with the Eastern Polish, uh, Polesia, or, or Lwów, or, 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 or uh, Vilno accents and, and the little sayings. But it's Polish. Quite often, when I go back to Poland, they say, oh, you know, when did you leave Poland? I said, 60 years ago. Gee, you speak well. I said, well, you know, we've, we've tried to preserve our language. <laughs> so without frequent get-togethers, how have so many of them managed to maintain not only the language, but their strong sense of Polishness? You see, we were taken from our home and associated with us is experiencing a heck of a lot of hunger, sickness, losing your parents, losing your brothers and sisters, and things like that. So therefore, you know, these things that were in Poland before 
all that happen, they're practically, they, they become idolized. Yeah. They're so important to you. And you wish to, you should sort of cling on to them. Well, Father, sometimes uh, get you get yourself confused because you, you never come the same way if you think in Polish and translate to English. Never come the same. And the same thing won't translate from English to Polish. You have to add up some words to make a sentence of it. When I count the sheep, I count them in Polish. I hope there's be more of them there. <laughs> It's very difficult actually when you're working to teach your children or something, language especially, because when you come from work, it's so much easier to communicate in the same language. But we had, uh, I, I thought children, we always said our prayers in Polish. Because of the political situation in Poland and trying to establish themselves in a new country, some of the orphans did not manage a return visit for many, many years. It was 43 years passed by since I met my mum. And then I come back as a grown-up person uh, with a daughter of, of my own. And actually I cried one night. I got so upset because when I was in Poland there because I sort of dreamt about it all these years, you know, for 43 years. And, but it was nothing like that. You know, we hugged and we with each other, but the closeness somehow wasn't there. I had no need to go back. I, I'd always thought that there was nothing there for me. It wasn't until we started tracing family that I found a need to go back and see what it was all about. And strangely enough, I got on a train out of Warsaw to the Russian border, where, was, where I was deported from, and uh, it felt like home. I really felt Polish. Well, the first time was a really salutary experience. I sort of felt like coming somewhere we belong. And almost feel, feel like uh, kissing the ground like the Pope did. I tell you what, like I never left. They welcomed me like I was there always with them. The biggest change that I noticed was the people addressing other people by major, professor, engineer. And I went to the telephone director and had a look. And he says he's here, engineer, captain, professor, in the telephone directory. And that's how I used to call them. I says, like bloody hell, I have to call you that name. <laughs> and that was very strange to me because I'm rather liberal in that aspect. The Poland that the orphans had left, that had diminished even in their own time, had drastically altered in their absence. The Poles have very little say in how this border is actually drawn. And in many ways, the new Poland um, reflects this. Its population has changed, the composition of its population has changed. Approximately 18% of its pre-war population had disappeared had killed, had been killed. 18%. Now this is in the region of more than 6 million people had been killed. And indeed this just in many ways just typifies, underlines just how horrific Poland's experience of the Second World War was. And despite the war being over, Poland was still not free. Travel in and out for the orphans or any visitor was strictly monitored as Cheshire found when she travelled to Poland while temporarily based in the UK during the 1960s. Actually, my brother told me that they, at the police station, they had about a file on me about two inches thick. I don't know what they put in. So that meant they recorded every movement and properly everything I said there. So it was all written down. I wouldn't mind getting hold of that file if I could. <laughs> For some, returning to Poland, to the place, memories, sights and sounds of their early childhood, is still a dream. I haven't been to Poland, actually. I was putting it off. When I retired about, what, about 40 years ago, we were planning to go to Europe. 
and my wife's sister lives in the in United States. So we took a few months and we traveled to the United States, but we stayed there for about three months and visited various places in the United States, and then got, went to Hawaii, to Fiji, <laughs> come back to New Zealand, <laughs> never travel any further. It's still my dream to, to go one day. Um, I just haven't had the time. <laughs> and life's been so full. I want to know what it feels like just being there because somehow I get the sense that I would know perhaps where I had come from. Only now I'm trying to find out which place in Poland I was born in and I've received um, some documentation saying that I was born around um, either in Warsaw or in the district of Warsaw. But as a small child, you know, whenever I was asked where I was born, I, I used to say, I was a princess born in Warsaw. It's been 60 years, but to many their arrival seems like yesterday, as the remaining 500 orphans look back over an incredible, almost unbelievable early life. Oh yes, we are. We're so, so thrilled that we lived, never thought I lived long enough to be celebrating 60 years New Zealand. Well, you got to be strong because when we were young, we, uh, I was at when my parents passed away in '42. I was only what 11 years old. You got to be strong to survive. And I think it's because of our inner strength, our inner spirit. And I think it's because of that uh, that we have become survivors in New Zealand, and that have, we have been able to become contributors in this country. All the group, especially from our group that arrived here nearly 60 years ago, I think just about everybody succeeded reasonably well. They don't depend on the state. They provide, worked hard, and probably the hardest thing, I think, that we probably found was to learn a new language. So to make a success of life, you have to go through adversity. And you often hear of rich people where their families, sons and daughters, finish up on the rocks somewhere. And it's because they, they have no incentive to, to get anywhere. It's all given to them. If you get out there and get it yourself, it's really worth something. Face actually had quite a lot to do with it because I reckon we wouldn't have survived Siberia and we wouldn't have got... Um, we would have found it a lot harder to get, go through everything else. I remember when they, the day they took us from a home in Poland, um, Mum said, you know, just quietly to us to pray um, within ourselves. And in the train, um, when we were crying and all that, she, she obviously sneaked out a, a prayer book and she said to me, Henya, just look at the garden angel and see how he's looking after these little children and you'll be all right. From a financial point of view, there's a group of people that have paid large amount of tax towards New Zealand government. But in addition to that, in addition to that, they all participated in the New Zealand way of life, but also participated in the... Uh, preserving the, 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 the Polish heritage, Polish school and Polish language. So after 60 years in New Zealand, who do they feel they are? Kiwis or Poles? Probably 50-50. Your heart comes from Poland, that's natural, but uh, living in, in New Zealand for such a long time, well, you have to say you, your home is here, your everything is here. Well, I have Kiwi ways and Polish heart. Well, I'll always be Paul. Uh, I can't lose that. I was born in Poland and I was Paul. Uh, I think I probably die as a Paul. But I'm um, New Zealander. I'm both, really. I, when, I, when I go to my Polish meetings, I'm Polish. <laughs> I sing my Polish songs, I talk in my Polish language. I'm a Kiwi. There's no question about it. I'm a, I'm a Kiwi. Number eight, why and all that. I can fix anything, I can do anything, I'm a Kiwi. But I'm a, a Kiwi of Polish extraction. But I consider myself more Polish in New Zealand. I have no options, actually. I think I'm both equally, I should say. 
I think we have not changed. We've not. We've still remained who we were, and I think you might laugh about it. I think we've become very good New Zealand citizens. At the Wellington Port, where a long journey ended and their life in New Zealand began, the orphans give thanks. This plaque confirms a permanent thank you to all those concerned. And I'm so pleased that 60 years ago, the New Zealand government heeded the advice of the scriptures when Jesus said, suffer little... Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's OK, Karen. I should get the Archbishop to read this, but <laughs> he has to do it every day. He's much better at it. <laughs> Suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. And I'll now unveil the plug. actually just about made me cry because the emotions were very strong you know remembering the whole procedure of traveling right through Russia and arriving in New Zealand being welcomed by the New Zealand public and um, you no know, it's just just too much the children of the Polish children these bright-eyed young New Zealanders prove that the migration to this country back in 1944 has been a success for them and for us. This program was made by the Polish Association of Christchurch and CTV.